just a few quick words about this lecture series. Um, it's titled uh, the Innovation Pathways to Sustainability Lecture Series, which is part of our TRA6 that stands for Transdisciplinary Research Area Innovation and Technology for Sustainable Futures. That's one of our profile areas, our six profile areas at the University of Bonn, where we try to pool research capacity, capacities across five faculties in the field of sustainability science. And today, uh, our distinguished guest speaker is uh, Martin Herold from Wageningen University, where he holds a Geoinformation Science and Remote Sensing Chair. He got his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2004, and habilitated in geography in 2009 at uh, Jena University. And Martin is an expert in developing and implementing land change monitoring systems using all sorts of innovative technologies and approaches. He currently works on a multitude of applications and uh, um, applications uh, related to climate change policy and sustainable development goals. I actually knew Martin back in 2008 or 9 when he was coordinator uh, of uh, the Cov C Gold land cover project. Um, when I was working on REDD, reducing emissions from deforestation degradation, which is, as you know, also a topic that draws heavily on remote sensing uh, expertise. And uh, Martin is also special in uh, being strongly committed to leveraging remote sensing technology for sustainable development in general and yeah, bringing practice expertise into science and science into practice expertise and has published uh, hundreds of papers which I think some of them, are, I think, will be summarized in the presentation today, which is titled Sensing for Sustainability, Novel Earth Observation Approaches Supporting the Land Use Sector. And with that, Martin, I'd like to pass the word to you. Thank, thank you once again for uh, making it for today. I know you have a busy schedule, so it's great that you, that you could make it. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, thanks, thank you, uh, Jan, and I can promise you, of course, we will come back to Red Plus related issues, of course. Uh, they, they, they have been shaping our agendas over the last 15 years quite a bit, so I can promise you that. And uh, also, thanks for the invitation. Very interesting lecture series. I've actually looked some of them uh, up myself online. Uh, also, congratulations to the University of Bonn for being successful with these excellence initiatives, which is, of course, as we all know, uh, they're big. Uh, they're important, and I was happy to see that also sustainability uh, is actually one of the, the key topics that are also now being picked up in this uh, excellence initiative implementation now uh, as, as, as one of the German universities. So very happy to be part of that. And I also titled my presentation a bit towards that, Sensing for Sustainability. It's also an area I work in. And essentially, it's, it's being driven by the question, so how or do we know, are we aware or how sustainable our actions are on the individual level, on the level of management units, uh, or even on the global level. And uh, we all know that Earth has been self-regulating itself for a long time. Uh, the Earth has, and nature has developed a sensory system to detect changes, to detect things that are happening, and it has been able to adapt to these changes. And that changes is, 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 is a part of nature. And the question now in the, in the time of the, yeah, people call it the Anthropocene, some people call it Gaia 2.0, is, is really, so how self-aware are we humans in, about the Earth's self-regulation and also in terms of our actions that are influencing that Earth's self-regulation? And uh, in one, uh, one statement, basically, that's, that I listed here as one of the uh, science uh, papers, the, the, the strong case is made that um, we don't have these self-awareness and uh, in particular when it comes to human actions and their impacts and basically the best thing we can do to get to the self-awareness is to improve our sensors that we can learn and understand and rectify and that this is really one essential step still needed for achieving or aiming for sustainability and that's where the title comes a bit from, uh, Sensing for Sustainability. I'm going to focus, of course, a lot on the on the land use sector. That's where I work, and that's where also, let's say, Earth observation is uh, providing a lot of opportunities to basically build the sensory system, this this system that tells us about our actions and their implications for sustainability. And I'll be doing 
the right things for it? Are we doing things right? And so on. And then I'll come to that over the course of my presentation, where I'd like to go through over basically three main parts. Um, the lecture is, 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 is 30 minutes, so uh, I will not be able to go in all um, uh, issues in the, with a lot of detail. I understand the audience is also very broad. We'll have uh, very technical people, as observation people, as much as people from application fields. So I'll, 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 I'll try to cover quite some ground. Some things might be relatively short, but there is a question and answer session afterwards. If you're interested in, 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 in some of these things in a bit more detail, we can pick them up there. I'm going to start looking a bit at, at tracking global land use dynamics and, of course, the role that Earth observation has in that. And uh, one nice way to show that if you look at uh, basically the, yeah, the seasonal heartbeat, basically, of the planet uh, that you see with Earth observation archives going back a long time. So this is basically a 40-year time series where you see this basic this movement of greening of vegetation uh, over the course of the seasons. Yeah, if you think about a sensory system, if you think about taking sense of, of, of how the Earth is behaving, in this case, the vegetation uh, system the Earth is behaving, is one of these nice, nice examples. And it's these, let's say, dense time series. It's these global archives that go back in time that really provide the base for us to do the kind of work. We use that information to derive also products, classically land cover information, land cover ca ca characterization, an example I'm showing here is just, just was released last month from the European Commission, global land cover at 100 meter resolution uh, from 2015 annual, and it includes land cover classes and also fractional layers. It's a it's a quite an operational system that is producing this information on a very regular basis. Oh, so basically, these time series data is the input to these kind of things, and uh, it provides now quite some flexibility for any kinds of users to tap into these basically land characterization database and use it for their purpose. Of course, if we have that information, if we have this data and we look more for more longer term changes, uh, that's a study ongoing like back to 1960s in terms of global land cover land use change. And often what happens if you use better data and we look at uh, dynamics in more detail, we also find that there's much more change, which is quite normal. Well, the more, the more detailed you look, the more changes you usually find. And uh, in fact, in this study, we find there's actually five, four times more land cover land use change over that period than we initially thought. So because most of that is human driven. And uh, so as humans, we probably have been more active on the planet uh, in terms of land cover land use change than we have noticed before. Uh, and of course, you see the big patterns, uh, you know, where forests are disappearing or forests have been increasing. And of course, we see, for example, in the global south, mostly forests disappearing, turning into agriculture or cro into cropland, whereas in the north, we rather see more of an expansion. Um, that's part of this uh, the globalized world that we see. And I also think there's quite a lot of work on going in Bonn on understanding and, and, and tracking these kind of processes. What's also very interesting is we do see phases of uh, acceleration and deceleration of land change. And for example, one of the interesting facts we see based on these data is that, for example, since 2007, 2008, we see a decline in the, in the, in the rate of conversion uh, after years of a more or less steady incline. Uh, and so that these are interesting findings that we, for the moment, have not really understood. Uh, we see in the data, and of course, it has to do with with agriculture, it has to do with agricultural subsidies and commod commodities that is driving a lot of these kind of kind of things. But point is being taken, uh, again, have that sensory system in mind that we're getting better in capturing dynamics and capturing uh, the changes and also the rates of the rates of changes that tell us a lot about how the, when we are behaving as humankind, but also how the planet is be behaving. Another example, very exciting field at the moment is space based above ground biomass monitoring. There's now a number of dedicated satellite missions that are really targeting at looking at forest structure and biomass. Um, these are, so we have proven that it's possible. Uh, we can show that it's possible also to produce that in time. And we're starting when you compare some of these uh, products, global products of global biomass, which are also at 100 meter resolution that we, if you compare it to plot data, to plot reference data, we get increasingly better in terms of the 
uh, the agreement between plot and reference data, but also we get increasingly consistent over time with this data. So we're actually starting to get a first sense of how can we use that information for actually looking at biomass changes uh, over at least the more recent periods. And we have other nice examples of how we can use these dense time series to look at, for example, more like system behavior kinds, kind of situations where you look at a temporal autocorrelation as a potential measure of resilience. We know that systems that are getting closer to tipping points or to critical transitions are increasing in their temporal autocorrelation. And it was nice that we were able to show in one of the studies to, to see how the temporal autocorrelation actually increases uh, as, a, as, a, as an effect of uh, mean annual pre pre precipitation. And so the more or the lower the mean annual precipitation becomes in these intact tropical forests, also the lower, uh, the higher the autocorrelation and the, ha the higher these uh, types of forests are actually closer to a critical state. Uh, and this is just exemplary of the type of analysis uh, that really use these dense and increasingly large um, uh, Earth observation archives to really study global dynamics, large area dynamics, and compare trends in space and time. In the second part, I would really then dive into a bit more on evolving technologies and approaches, and as I'm going to use three examples. The first one is really that we are able to provide information increasingly fast. And basically, these satellites are acquiring data on a regular basis, and one of the applications is what people call near real time detection. So anytime you have a new observation from satellites, and then here we're talking about uh, daily, weekly type of observations. Every time a new observation comes in, you can basically track whether this new observation is abnormal or different than what you have observed in the past for a certain location on, on the Earth's surface. Huh? And this information is quite useful because it can really give us information on where things are changing and whether we actually observe a certain critical or unwanted be be behavior, basically on a global scale um, at high spatial and temporal detail. And I get, and give you an example. These are basically Euro European, uh, European satellite data-based analysis. What you see here is the Congo Basin. And that's zoom into an area that's, a, that's basically a logging exercise, you see a logging road going in, and once the logging road goes in, you see left and right how the, the tree removal is basically hap happening. So those are basically weekly data uh, from satellites that show basically this encroachment of the, of, the, of the forest in terms of the logging infrastructure and the tree ex extraction and how that progresses over time. These are not local case studies. This is basically, <clears throat> these are operational running systems providing weekly updates for the whole of the Congo Basin, and there are some systems who are already actually working on the pantropical pan level. Another important area uh, is the use of, people call it near sensing or very localized sensing. Uh, so this is often, this is based on either terrestrial sensor webs, or this is available from, from what people call unmanned airborne vehicles or drones, uh, where you particularly if you have drones that can provide you information about the three-dimensional structure of vegetation. For example, in this case, we're looking at forest, for example, using uh, laser scanning uh, to really give us really very detailed information, uh, very much on a local, local setting. And so basically you get information based on the, on the tree level. What is the, yeah, what not only the size of the tree, the structure, but you get information about the volume, the woody wall volume, the leaf area, and all these kind of information, which in the past was very hard to obtain. And the nice thing about these drone-based uh, observations is it is relatively autonomous and it's relatively frequent. Uh, so you as, we as researchers uh, or practitioners, we are more or less able to launch our own system and operate our own system. So we're not relying anymore as much on, 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 on airplanes or uh, other kind of uh, app, you know, platforms that we've used in the past. So if you want to go fly, for example, on the farm or on a, on a, over a certain unit, you can basically do that now uh, quite accurately and quite pre pre predictably. And that's actually quite important to really give us better information. For example, we can use that for crops to look at biomass and height of crops and trees. And in Wageningen, we have a, a related drone facility that is now 10, 10 years old. I provided the link there. And that is also one of the key inputs through this 
yeah, these high throughput phenotyping activities that are ongoing. Uh, and where also I understand the University of Bonn is, is, is part of this, uh, this larger collaboration network. I don't have a whole lot of time to go in a lot of detail, but you know, there's the classical examples uh, of uh, biomass estimation to really look at evaluating plant soil feedback and agriculture system to modeling the woody volume of biomass of trees. Huh? Also to look at specific species, it's also very feasible to deploy these systems in tropical forests. Um, so to really look for specific species of, for example, ec ec economic value or species for a specific uh, conservation val val value. And then of course we have an evolving uh, area of what well, people call it data science or artificial intelligence. I would like to introduce that here with one example on land use monitoring. Um, so also mapping different land use types was also, also something that was uh, in the past not really possible. We said, oh, we can derive information about the land cover. That's what we can see from satellites. But increasingly, we also have the opportunity to look at land use and different land use types and land use activities. And keep in mind these processes uh, with dense time series that you are able to see. Uh, with this uh, with this type type of earth observation data, and what helps us to really go from land use monitoring is yeah some of these deep learning approaches. Uh, so some of these um, these very detailed neural networks that can really train complexity of different features and can really take advantage of not only the temporal information of satellite data but also the spatial context and and uh, all kinds of spectral information integration of different data sources to really make predictions about certain land, land land use types and this is an example here that looks at land use that follows deforestation uh, which is also an important uh, uh, characterization uh, for for example the types and the, the drivers of ch of change related to tropical deforestation and based on these deep learning approaches i think we can get a pretty good handle now on more or less uh, not completely automatic. I mean, once you have a trained model, you can aim for automatic detection. But of course, these models need, need to be trained well. But once trained well, you can actually do a reasonably good job to look at different land use types following deforestation for different parts of the for different parts of the tropics. And then this is a very let's say a nice example on some of these deep learning approaches. Uh, they are available, and it's. Basically, you, you have a good training, you train the model, and it gives you an answer, and you can be quite happy with that because if, if the results are good, and you can show the results are good or not, and then it gives you a, yeah, a prediction of land use. Um, the, the downside, of course, of these approaches is that you're not really sure why you get the answer. Huh? These, are, these are big, complex models, and um, yeah, we as uh, also, not only Earth observation experts, but also as experts interested in land use and checking land use dynamics, we of course are interested also why things uh, are being the way they are. And so, with all this evolution of deep learning and these computer vision approaches that are now being used for these large Earth observation archives, there are also some, uh, I think, important steps that still need to happen. Uh, and I would like to put them out there, and perhaps that's also worth a discussion afterwards. I mean, we have to keep in mind that these. Um, artificial intelligence approaches or machine learning, uh, they of course can only predict what they learn. Uh, so they cannot really extrapolate beyond what you learn. So if there are unknowns and you don't learn for them, you, you won't find them really. And that is a, that is a big, that's a big lim limitation. And you might not even know that, you, that you're not finding, finding them. So there are of course efforts to try to overcome that plex, black box. There's a whole field looking at interpretable or explainable artificial intelli intelli intelligent, um, but that it's, it's an evolving field, let's, let's say. Um, I think also when we think about models versus data, uh, I think a lot of us have worked with process-based models in some way or another, or have, from the Earth observation side, have tried to provide data that can be used by some process-based modeling, for example, crop growth modeling, dynamic vegetation modeling, even global climate modeling. Um, and it's it's been mostly, or for a large um, time, it has been quite a, a tedious and something frustrating exercise because, of course, observation provides interesting information, but but it often doesn't provide exactly the units that the model needs. Uh, it's often a proxy of some kind, but it provides these space-time dynamics, which is which is very important. And so we've always been a bit in this limbo 
uh, between model and data, and it has worked in some cases, but in others it has not. On the other hand, now we have these data-driven approaches, with, for example, deep learning, that you know you don't necessarily need to have the process understanding. If you can train the model, you can directly predict. You might not need a model if you just look for an answer. Huh? And of course, that is a possibility, and that's happening. But I guess the the real value would be, and that not only to um, to uh, make use of these approaches, but also really to enable the progress as an interdisciplinary exercise to really how one can combine these two approaches. And so this idea of hybrid modeling or these physics aware machine learning, this is a field that's actually quite interesting. It's quite important. There is some interesting developments there in terms of dealing with the error functions, or you can use physical simulations in probabilities for, let's say, deep learning application and so kind of on. But uh, to be honest, for our field, uh, uh, in terms of, for example, crop growth, in terms of vegetation modeling and stuff, I think we're still there's still a lot of things that can be developed there. And um, yeah, I just wanted to point to put it out there because I think that's an that's an important area that we'll have to look more at in the future. Um, then, of course, my last point or my last main area is then actually looking at some of these examples and demonstration more towards sustainability. And if you, of course, talk about sustainability and how the various types of observations can be useful, we can, you can use, for example, the policy cycle as one of these frameworks to say, okay, we need to go from, yeah, being aware of a problem, uh, defining a problem to what could be the right policy options and activities to do to address those, to mitigate or to adapt, to implement them, and of course, to eventually evaluate the performance. And we have let's say differentiate, different, differentiate observation needs along that policy cycle that also can be fed from Earth observation data. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some examples and some of the also new things or exciting new things that I think are hap happening. Well, first example is that we're moving really towards uh, for the climate change mitigation people among us uh, towards spatially explicit greenhouse gas inventories. That is, that happens increasingly also on the national level but also on the global level. Huh? So we are now, with all the Earth observation data inputs, uh, we're really able to make spatially pre explicit predictions on, for example, what you see here, forest-related uh, sinks and sources over reasonably long periods and at a very high spatial resolution. Huh? So it's, and that's actually quite interesting because if you look at this map, for example, you see a lot of the world's forests are green, huh? which means, and that's maybe not too surprising, over the period that's shown here, forests are mostly sinks, and that's what it is because that's what forests do. They grow and take up carbon uh, for the for the most part, unless they are being you know affected by some type of dis, dis, disturbance. Uh, but it's very important, for example, you think about climate change mitigation policies and activity planning and these kind of things to know where these sinks and sources are, uh, where they're located in space and time, how they're evolving, and that is what we think this kind of information can be very useful for, um, for not only to assess, yeah, what are the carbon sinks and sources, where are they, but where do activities or certain mitigation acti act activities on should be focused on with priority. Also a climate change mitigation example is to look at these forest and agricultural nexus, which we all know is a bit of a is a is a is a critical one to achieve achieve sustainability, but yet we have seen very little uh, really progress on that. That's a, that's a study from Kenya, looking at livestock uh, sector in Kenya, and also the link to the forest sector, uh, because forest grazing is one of the key issues that uh, is preventing re regrowth in the forests of Kenya, uh, and to look at mitigation scenarios both related to milk yield to reducing yield gap and changing feeds, but also the impact on forests and forest-related greenhouse gas emissions and removals, including a, a restoration option. Uh, and if you, uh, and it's possible now with, with some innovative data uh, approaches to really combine livestock data, forest remote sensing and farm surveys to really produce integrated analysis to look into to, to the complexity of, you know, what are the mitigation options giving these multiple dimensions of, um, yeah, of relevance in terms of produ productivity and of green greenhouse gas emissions and removals. Also a nice example is related to this, what I mentioned for, before, this near real-time 
monitoring. They're looking at an area now in Indonesia. Uh, this is basically, again, a weekly al alert. So these red dots are basically uh, weekly uh, changes in a, tr a tree cover. Uh, you see a lot of dynamics happening. Uh, a lot of these dynamics are actually plantation dynamics. So in oil palm plantations, so they are basically cleared out and, and, and re regrown. What is, of course, most important for sustainability is where um, forests are changing. They are not plantations. And that's where you zoom into uh, you know, certain regions say like, okay, this has been a natural forest. This has been encroached. And this is particular area, areas that are important for, for example, zero deforestation pledges from yeah, international commodity com companies. And in fact, this information has been developed and is provided to uh, a coalition of, of 10 major oil palm producers that are yeah, really um, yeah, investing in into sustainable supply chain monitoring and into zero deforestation supply chain monitoring. And that's what they're most interested in is where information or where forests or natural forests are being encroached in relation to um, yeah, oil palm op 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 operation in Indo Indonesia and Malaysia. Huh? That's a nice example on where you can start because the information is coming quick. Huh? It's information that's quite relevant where this information is really becoming actionable huh? for people. And actionable for, for people, uh, of course, also includes that this information is available, for example, in the hands of people that can do something with it. So this idea of interactive or participatory monit monit monitoring where you can probably, for example, provide alerts as we've just seen weekly level to people on the on the ground for example for biosphere monit monitoring to support certain incentive systems uh, for local communities protecting certain types of forest or aiming to uh, do a certain kind of uh, uh, land use management choices and there are some nice examples actually on how that is being uh, done in practice um, it is not so easy as it often might sound uh, this engagement with participatory approaches, there is more than just a technical dimension. Uh, there's an important governance dimension. There's an ownership dimension. Uh, yeah, that that has to also be taken into account here because otherwise these systems don't work. But there are some examples on on how that can actually happening. And basically, bottom line is that um, if these monitoring systems, these adaptive systems, are linked to certain incentive systems or can be linked to certain incentive systems, then you often have also or can create a bit of a win-win sit sit situation for these systems to also operate in the long term. And then, of course, and I promised Jan to come back to Red Plus. Uh, Red Plus uh, being a key mechanism of the Paris Agreement, Paris Climate Agreement, and before that, ten years have been a, a key, um, let's say, pathway also for developing countries to step up and says, yes, we are also willing to do our share of the global climate change mitigation by reducing deforestation and enhancing forests and forest carbon stocks. Monitoring of tropical forests has been uh, in the center line of that and enabling countries and stakeholders to do that. And, um, well, with Gossi Gold, uh, with some colleagues, and it's also certain uh, part of my career has been invested into um, yeah, looking at approaches that can work, uh, not only looking into them, but also providing guidance to people who want to do it providing training material, supporting capacity development to really increase the capacities of tropical countries in particular to uh, for forest monitoring. And we've seen the, we now see the results of that. Huh? And we I'm just showing results from the late, latest forest resources assessment of FAO, just published a few weeks ago. And what you see here is the remote sensing capacity in, the, in figure 1B. The NFI, so National Forest Inventory Capacity of Countries 2020, and below that, even more interesting, interesting is the capacity changes, and you see a lot of green, um, both related to the use of remote sensing and the use of NFIs in the tropical world. Huh? So we see basically 2005, 2020, that a lot of countries are now reporting to the FAO based on much better data, uh, both in terms of remote sensing and in terms of NFI, while at the same time they don't see a lot of decline in capacity. Huh? So these investments have really uh, improved the abilities to monitor tropical forests, not only on the global level or the stuff that we do as scientists or, or let's say global monitoring uh, uh, kind of initiatives, but uh, really also on the levels of countries. And that basically concluded a bit my, my walk through the, 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 the policy wheel, huh? so the big awareness definition problems, finding the policy options, for example, where are the hotspots, uh, 
uh, of potential mitigation and adaptation activities? How can we support implementation, for example, for the near, near real time systems, provide local information, and the evaluated performance for, for example, greenhouse gas inventories, and also on the global level, for example, when it comes to the UNFC, UNFCCC stock tank? So, with that, I'd like to start to conclude. Um, our Earth observation progress really builds upon the stents and long archives of satellite data, time series algorithms, and you know increasingly these big data or big data era kind of ana analytics that we uh, have at hand. Earth observation provides global data with local relevance in terms of particular in terms of dynamics. We can look at different types, speeds of changes, and these kind of kind of things. With this information, we also see an improved linking between dynamic information and human actions. Huh? And in that context, also the uh, availability of terrestrial and drone based sensing is very important. Uh, they can basically provide a bit also, if you think about it from a global monitoring pers perspective, a bit of a missing link between what's on the ground, what's happening on the ground to what we see from space. But it really also provides a lot of very uh, uh, very important local data uh, and also a lot of physical understanding on what's on what's hap happening so when we talk about global monitoring we should not forget that these kind of systems these local systems are also very important to improve our abilities to monitor global i talked a little bit about this new data science and earth uh, artificial intelligence opportunities uh, and they're basically we can take advantage of them, but we can really make them useful if we can link them to process understanding and modeling. And, you know, we should not forget that in Europe we have the Copernicus program. Uh, the Copernicus, besides so Galileo, is basically the European investments in a GPS type system. Copernicus is the European investment in an Earth observation system. And we're basically world leading on that now in Europe. And so, with that, with Copernicus being op operational, we are basically in the golden age with Earth observation and again, Europe in a leadership role. When we then think about more towards sustainability, sustainability, well, we have, we can provide differenti differentiated observation support, identifying problems, helping to identify the right pol pol policies, supporting the implementation and the, and the evaluation of those examples, try to el elucidate some related to sustainable supply chain monitoring, climate change mitigation, conservation, um, yeah, restoration I didn't mention, but it's one of the areas. Nature-based solution now is a big topic now that uh, also I think uh, a lot of people are looking into those observations to help assessing those. Um, uh, also an, an issue, maybe also in a discussion item, uh, this forest agricultural nexus, uh, we know, and that's true for my own university in Wageningen, that the forest, the agricultural sector are still largely dis disconnected in, in research, in policy and in practice. Uh, and then perhaps more data-driven analysis can really help to start to stimulate more interaction there. And, and of course, when we talk about sustainable development and the sustainable development goals and uh, the long list of them that, uh, you know, uh, we have Earth observation as one of the key data sources to really provide inf information on those. Uh, so these indicators on the sustainable development goals are really uh, are using Earth observation as one of the key information sources. Another point I'd like to mention is, uh, and that's a development we also see over the last years quite a bit, this idea about enhancing transparency. Uh, the, Paris the Paris Climate Agreement has an enhancing transparency framework, which is very new. It's very interesting to see that um, this notion that uh, the Paris Climate Agreement is very much about, yeah, everybody should contribute uh, to, to, to aim for this 1.5 or 2 degree target. Um, and then only transparency, if everybody's transparent about it, we can actually sum up or get an idea of the collective action that everybody's doing. And so this enhanced trans transparency is, is quite an, an, an important discussion. And of course, Earth observation with providing a lot of free and open data, a lot of open source, so a lot of open source so solution, quite synoptic information, uh, long archives and stuff like that have quite an important role also in these enhancing transparency debate. And of course, actual, actionable information, huh? so that the data is at the hands of the right people at the right time, is really something we are hoping that this information can really be a cat catalyst for more. Um, yeah, some of the transformation changes we need, some of the local actions or in interventions that we want to look at, um, or that we need to look at when it comes to yeah, sustainable and climate smart land, land use. 
And with all of that, I'd like to end up again in my initial set out uh, yeah, idea of this descent, the sensor system of a self-aware Earth, particularly self-aware Earth, that humans, that we are aware of our actions, the implications of that and how they relate to sustainability. And I think I've shown that some of that is starting to be built, uh, but I've also outlined some of the things that I think where that, that such sensory, sensory system can really develop over the next, the next, next years to basically serve as one of the key pillars to aim towards sustainability. And with that, thank you very much. Okay, Martin, thanks a lot. Now we have time for questions. And, and the first question is coming from Jürgen Kuscher, I suppose. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Jürgen Kuscher from the Institute of Geodesy and Geoinformation here in Bonn. My question, well, first of all, congratulations for your very uh, interesting presentation. My question is, when we are interested to understand things, for instance, to test hypotheses, how do we modify or how do we add to climate change through land use modification, for instance, through these various pathways by modifying the carbon cycle by modifying the water cycle, the energy cycle, we need to work with coupled physical simulations, what you would call process models. So my question would be, and I think you mentioned this on one of your slides, what is the role of Earth observation data when on the other hand, for, for the cause and action chain, we need these physical models? Yeah. You, I think you mentioned the hybrid approaches. Can you say a few words on what's the future here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. So thanks for the question. I, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Um, I mean, we have basically, if you think about the climate change mitigation that's limited to the land use or the forest sector, let's, let's say forest sector climate change mitigation focus, we do have an interesting um, situation that we have let's say a lot of the information that comes from the IPCC reports, uh, these, these, these scientific bases and stuff like that, these global information, they're largely based on indeed physically based carbon dynamic vegetation integrated assessment models. Whereas, for example, when we look at then greenhouse gas information on the country level, where the policies are made uh, and where the, the policies are being designed and implemented, we see a lot of data and also a lot of data gaps still, but a lot of data that's being used and basically not much physical based modeling there. Huh? And I think now there is a process and uh, and that's part of this enhancing transparency framework that I mentioned to you in FCC where people are trying to, we can only make sense to understand that how far are we towards this two degree target if we really bring that together. Huh? And that's what's called the global stock take. Huh? And so there are these, these um, this understanding these different approaches and these different basically uh, almost philosophies on thinking about carbon dynamics and how human actions affecting that carbon dynamics is is um, is can play out to, together. And one for me fundamental difference is that a lot of these dynamic vegetation models and carbon models they are basically about carbon that the carbon's in the center and they model the carbon the fluxes and stuff like that. A lot of the greenhouse gas inventories, although they are they are mentioned, they are, they are basically greenhouse gas inventories. They are essentially about human activities. So it's the human activities that drive that you assessed first, and then you get the carbon impact of those. First. And that is one of the key fundamental differences in these two approaches. And that will be one of these tricks on how to bring that together. And so I think at the carbon modeling side, there has to be more of these. So what are the impact of more direct human activities? How do they mod modify it? And how can one uh, provide information that's even more relevant on the policy on the national or the local level, uh, whereas the national greenhouse gas inventories has to provide much more information that can also be added up to the whole carbon cycle. Uh, because if you look only at activity-based things, you're missing an important part of the, the big natural carbon cycle. So that's one example. But you also ask about a bit these, um, about this hybrid modeling. And I think this hybrid modeling is very much about um, yeah, these, yeah, these no new opportunities with data science and 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 uh, artificial intelligence. Intelligent. I mean, I've I've spent probably with colleagues. There's like at least two or three 
generations of H2020 projects where we always try to produce, produce better data to feed into carbon cycle models. And it, it's always been, well, there's been like successes, some successes, but mostly it was always a bit like, you know, a bit of a, a, a bit of a, let's say complicated process. Whereas now from the data side, uh, I mean, you can make predictions much more directly. Yeah? And then the question is, so, I mean, in theory, you can make predictions data driven empirical deep learning base you don't necessarily need the models right to make a certain prediction if you can train for it right um and then so we have a risk of of really aiming for a a bit of an ice too isolated progressions here as well uh? and i think uh i've tried to explain a bit the deep learning approaches artificial intelligence they're nice if you have the data but you don't really know when when you get the right answer or if you get a good answer you're not sure why and that's the problem uh, and that is what will make that information also, again, limiting for policies and stuff like that, or, or people who want to understand. And also, even us as Earth Observation people, I want to know what, you know, what kind of Earth Observation information is most useful uh, for, for example, predicting certain things. Whereas the process people is like, okay, what is the type of process maybe that I can replace by a neural network rather than you know, having a complex differential equation that I will never have the data to fully, uh, to fully basically get the data from to capture the dynamics and stuff like that. And I think that is the debate that has to happen. And there, there have been some interesting concepts developed, but uh, for example, you could use, yeah, this physics and machine learning. You can produce, you know, for a crop growth model, you can produce an envelope from a model. Uh, crop growth models are very much driven by climate data, huh? so you can produce certain envelopes of, of what is physically possible, uh, and then use the Earth observation to make prediction as soon as you have new operation and these kind of things. So conceptually, there are some things there, but to be honest, I think there's more that 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 could be done there. We're, we're just we're just a bit at the at the beginning, and but it's an opportunity because these kind of data model dichotomy that, that we have been in, it, uh, again, it frustrated me a lot. And I think we have an opportunity now to really work more closely together, I think. Thank you. Okay, Uwe Rascher is the next one. Yep. So Uwe Rascher speaking from the Research Center in Jülich. So thanks, thanks, Martin, for the talk and especially for bringing together the new possibility which we have of this long term remote sensing time series and how to link this to politics and decision making. Um, I have a question to the long term satellite time series, because we know from the past that these things can be tricky. Such a time series which dates back to the last millennium normally is not recorded by one satellite, but different satellites which are then merged. Uh, in the platform of Copernicus, for example. Um, and in the past, there were some instances where some trends which were then observed later on could be shown to be artifacts to changing uh, solar orbits or to changes in satellites. So what's your opinion or what's your knowledge of the insight from the Copernicus platform? Are the time series which are now provided by Copernicus robust? Um, or do we have to be careful for internal measurement trends, which still may lay in these time series? Yeah, yeah, very good, good question. Lots of aspects there, so I'll I'll try to cover uh, some of them. Thanks, thanks, Ruben. Um, so in general, and and also for the Earth observation, for the people that are not so familiar with Earth observation, so there is there were satellites have been around for a long time, and like I said, uh, I have shown the time series at the beginning, which goes back to the early '80s, for example. Uh, which basically provides monthly vegetation greenness data uh, back to 1980, but that's relatively simple, very coarse spatial resolution data. So basically, the the point is the further you go back in time, uh, and for example, you have to make a difference between, let's say, before 2000, roughly 15, before 2000, and then before 1990. And the further you go back, the coarser and the more limiting these archives. Uh, are in terms of also what we can do with it. Of course, there is. It's nice to have long, consistent time series. That's one of the for the lens surface. Somewhat, that's the one of the long and consistent ones we actually have. But basically, it's essentially one signal per month, per eight by eight kilometer, right? And I mean, I agree that people have tried to massage out of that information a lot of perhaps I well, call it information, a lot of predictions. Let's say that are that you know maybe were there or maybe not huh? so that's let's let's say it like like that 
and one of the limits that we have with these data and and the and the kind of the limited let's say um spectral uh, information that we have it is you can basically you're limited to to basically empirical analysis uh? so you cannot include a lot of physically based estimation in these kind of things and that is of course one of the problems that you get you're limited to these very often very simple empirical type series and analysis that that give you trends and proxies but to put units on those or relevant units for many users is very tough uh? i mean this is now the more recent it is changing huh? because i mean we have more satellite data and with the european copernicus program which really started around 2015 huh? so the copernicus so for the you know for the exports among our sentinel one and sentinel two huh? so really for these land monitoring satellites where we really talk about 10 to 20 meter resolution uh, uh, high temporal revisit so land use sector type information huh? Then, because we have more spectral bands, we have radar and optical systems. I mean, we have we have the opportunity to do much more physically based things. Um, but interesting enough, we don't really do that as much, huh? which is a bit surprising. We, we are still a bit in this kind of phase of yeah empirical time series analysis, doing simple things uh, because we, we know where that goes, and and it's exciting. Huh? It, it, you can still get a lot of information out of those things. Huh? Um, but when we talk about also eventually looking into, uh, I mean, Germany will launch um, NMAP. NMAP is a hyperspectral satellite system supposed to be launched next year. The next generation of Sentinels supposed to have a hyperspectral system is supposed to have a, an L-band radar system. So I think the, the kind of opportunity to do more physically based stuff is really there and it's even increasing now for the years to come. And I think this kind of more exploration of the spectral domain yeah, in this kind of assessment is really kind of a key area which was basically overlooked. Yeah. And then, of course, you come to fluorescence. Yeah. I mean, Uwe, I know you work on that quite a bit. We have the flex mission coming up, um, but also with these hyperspectral systems on the horizon, I think there will be much more opportunities. And these are basically physically, physically much more meaningful measurements that give, that give us yeah, real units uh, that tell us about processes more directly rather than rather than em empirically. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Okay, and the next question is coming from our TRA6 spokesperson, Joachim von Braun. Uh -huh. Thank you for your talk. Great, interesting, Martin. Uh, I have a uh, straightforward question and one uh, to discuss. Uh, the straightforward one is um, uh, about this um, decline in conversion. Uh, where and why did it happen? And um, can you say simply a bit more about that? Uh, the question for discussion is, um, um, how about uh, mapping in people into the uh, land use change? People's health, people's responses to economic opportunities, um, um, people respond to incentives, uh, to markets, to jobs, and so on. Um, so uh, from a, an economics perspective, um, that might bring us closer to causality, understanding um, uh, land use change from the bottom up. Um, what's your comment on that? Okay. Yeah, also thanks for the question and I mean this I don't have an answer on this decline of conversion rates I mean we are now expanding the time series 2019 eh? so the analysis was 2015 we're now expanding 2019 to see whether that is really a, a continuous trend that we are observing or not uh, this is a collaboration also with um, KIT so uh, cultural institute tech, tech, tech technologies and the modeling uh, economic modeling group there and I think the I mean, the, the, the answer probably lies somewhere in the, or is, or we are, ho or we are hoping, or we are assuming the answer lies something, has something to do with, with agricultural trade and, and commodity trade. And then we see a bit of decline there. Maybe there's an effect of the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 uh, that has an impact, impact there or stuff like that. But these are only hypotheses at the moment. It's at the moment a data signal, we see it. We have some hypotheses, we don't, but we don't have really an analysis. And of course, this is a global trend. It also varies regionally a bit uh, because we see in particular, for example, in Africa, it's, it's quite pronounced. So it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah? But that's the nice thing of 
data-driven analysis, you're finding new and interesting things. So I, I hope to be able to give you an answer maybe in, in, a, in a year's time. But we're currently looking into research, looking into that and trying to understand that. And, and I see then, of course, your motivation from the economic side, because at the end, I think it has to do with economics. Yeah? That's, that's a bit the, the, the broad answer to that. When it comes to people, I have to bring the people in. I mean, with Earth observation, primarily we see the physical Earth surface. Yeah? We don't see people. And we see, of course, the, the direct impacts also that human, humans have on the land surface. Yeah? So I remember this animation where I showed the logging road and the trees, you know, extraction stuff like that i mean we're getting to the to the point where you see you start to see processes when they're actually happening i mean of course we don't see the humans but we see the processes and the the the, the foot the footprints of, of of those and for example having information more on these detailed information of processes or so not just a set of maps but really understanding processes i think that creates some opportunity to really look into you know what are extraction rates in certain regions why they are the way they are why operations are happening in this region and not in that that with that region is this a commercial op operation is that a smallholder op operation and these kind of kind of things where these opportunities are coming in how to link that to livelihoods and these kind of things that is very much a local question and that is very much something where also the earth observation is there really has to be combined with other types of data sources i mean there are examples to link these kind of space-time patterns with agent-based modeling or some other these kind of modeling approaches where you start to basic more more mimic the behavior of, 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 of actors, for example, in space and time and, and certain, certain choices, but to provide, uh, let's say, more direct economic information or link that it's it's still, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's a very case-based, let's say, a local case-based situation. We have, of course, I've example mentioned these, uh, let's say, yeah, tracking land use or land use change processes. Uh, one of these examples, we have also, of course, signals that are a bit more directly caused by humans. You might recall there are uh, satellite time series looking at nighttime lights, uh, so basically at, at, at visible lights, or also fire, uh, active fire data, and these kind of things, which are maybe a bit more easily linked to direct human act activities. But that's basically the same thing. It really depends on the the local context and the process you're looking at to make that information valuable to better understand what's actually happening. Um, there is an interesting point about incentives. Um, and I uh, I mentioned um, this example of this interactive or participatory mon monitoring, which is one of the aims to get the stakeholders actively involved in the mon monitoring. In fact, stake these stakeholders or these land use or land management stakeholders are often not necessarily so interested in monitoring as first instance, but they get interested in being part of mon monitoring processes if they have an incentive to do so. Yeah? And so, uh, as I mentioned, these interactive systems, the interactive meaning you send, for example, certain alerts that some unwanted behavior observed from satellite or other sources is happening in some regions, right? And people are going to check and stuff like that. And they, and for that checking, because they have to protect a certain area or, or whether they have to uh, yeah, have certain interventions ongoing or they have restoration areas or areas that they have, have to res restore and the satellite detected the disturbance and stuff like that. There, that's where this information gets closer to yeah, human ac activities to the people on the, on, the, on the ground. One second. And, um, and so that's why I said also these systems, these interactive, these participatory systems, they really work if there is an incentive system related to that, if the monitoring is done for a reason. Might it be a red plus climate change mitigation policy where, you know, you have kind of carbon as the, as the commodity of some kind, or may it be a conservation goal or a restoration or a nature-based solution goal or an agricultural subsidy, uh, so, to, so to say, where localized information can help to link to these land use pro, uh, processes. But the direct link is really, it's very case-based, I would, I, would, I would say. Okay, uh, the next question is going in the same direction, coming from the chat. And uh, Renzo Giudice has, has a question. Okay, it goes in the same direction, but integrating the people, because if you're looking on your policy cycle, Right then, the yeah. obvious it's it's important which people are acting, yeah. and yeah. Um, 
I mean, this is still a little bit more complex issue than only only related to what Jürgen Kusche says. You have a, have some natural science related models, <laughs> but you, if you expand this to the uh, social sciences, it's not getting easier. So, uh, what do you think? The question is: Is it uh, is this still a limitation, not in integrating these social sciences or the people's insight in the, in the idea modeling? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks. A couple of points. And there's even a second question, I think, but I'll, let's let's start with the first one. Um, so, the in the in the policy cycle uh, that you refer to, I think we have done a lot of progress on using Earth observation data, really in identifying the problem. Like I said, these IPCC reports. Uh, also, it is a good example. So, what is the problem? You know, what's and then even to some in, the, in a let's say in a broad, global, regional sense of what could be potential sol solutions to 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 address that. Um, so that's where I've made a lot of progress, and I think, and I showed that example for the Red Plus related country capacities of forest monitoring that we have quite a bit of progress in actually improving greenhouse gas inventories. And greenhouse gas inventories is really at the aim of yeah regular reporting on what the greenhouse gas emissions and removals for land use uh, and forests in a certain country. Uh, so we have done also quite a bit of progress there. But what we have really not done a whole lot is make use of the information for be identifying policy options, not so much on the global level, but really on the national scale or the subnational scale, and then also really helping to implement it. And I think that's also starting to be more realized uh, that, for example, greenhouse gas inventories, it's, 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 I mean, it's nice that we focus on reporting something at the end, but what we really need is action. And then to use the information to really, uh, really do the right things and to support that these actions are going to be happening. And that's where, for example, I show this example of the spatially explicit greenhouse gas inventories. Greenhouse gas inventories are generally not spatially explicit, but really to show where are, in a country setting or in a region setting, where are the hotspots of emission and removals, where certain types of changes are happening, because these should be areas of prior priorities where, for example, certain activities should be implemented. If you are a, a, a land manager, or a forest manager, or maybe a, 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 you know, an agricultural extension officer or whatnot, and you have certain choices, how can that person get the right information that's needed for him to make the right choices locally, for, for, for example? I think these are the, uh, the critical questions where I think more uh, of that type of information and is needs to be put in that direction and that's where having information uh, more timely and more accurate and more detailed is really helping that and then uh, so coming back to a question of over russia on that we have a long historical time series at the end when you talk about land management you don't need to look back 40 years uh, you don't even even need to maybe look back 10 years sometimes you, i mean you need information now about the choices and you know, farmers have one year, they plan it maybe a bit longer term and these kind of things. So I think there, it's not so much about the long time series. It's basically to have good and accurate information, maybe for the last one, two, three years as a reference, but more really on what's happening now. Uh, and that's where this more timely, more detailed information is really helping to go in that direction. Um, on your second question, uh, the, the, the basically the accuracy, yeah? and it's, it's actually interesting to say that, that these trade-offs between increasing time resolution and accuracy, and that's actually true, that uh, there's always been the more detailed information you derive, can be detailed in space and time, and it also thematic detail, the more uncertain things usually become. Yeah? Um, I mean, with the availability of satellite data now, that's starting to become less of, an, less of a trade-off. For example, these near real-time systems I mentioned about, they basically provide weekly data. And the detection accuracy of those are actually quite good. Huh? They're, 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 they're really well trained. And so you get basically 10 meter resolution forest change alerts for the whole Congo Basin on a weekly basis, 10 meter resolution. And that and with a quite a reasonable ac accuracy. Huh? So there, uh, of course, if you go to monthly or bi-monthly reporting, you probably reduce some of the errors that you still have there. But there, the value of the inf information is to be fast uh, and have it something quick and perhaps accept a certain ambi ambiguity. And you can actually play when, when you understand the ac accuracies, how you would use that information for a certain application. So are you more interested in, do you want to optimize for commission errors so you, you, you detect 
rather more changes, but make sure you detect them all, or you want to avoid omission. So you make want to make sure every single one is really uh, you really catch basically with these kind of systems. You can optimize it in that direction. For all of these more operational things, um, in one of my early slides, I presented the Copernicus Global Land Cover Service, hundred meter globally annual. These systems, these operational systems, they come with a sophisticated, independent validation system. So every year, satellite data are being added to produce new land cover estimates. You also add reference data, uh, so basically high quality interpretations of re re reference data to provide an independent assessment of the accuracy. And um, basically, don't think about these data sets as a map. They are basically a characterization database. There's, of course, land cover classes and types, but there's also land cover fractions. So tree cover, shrub cover, agricultural, uh, cropland cover, um, bear cover, water cover, urban cover, so all of these things. And uh, basically all of these come with uncertainty information, even spatial ac accuracy maps now, that you can get a bit of an understanding on where things, at least on the, in a relative sense, more, are more uncertain uh, in some places than in, than in others. So I think there's really a lot of information provided to that. What I think is one of the critical things there is we're providing a lot of that uncertainty information with the product and with the information. What has to still improve is how that uncertainty information that is also relatively flexible can be uh, used by people who are picking it up for uncertain application. People often need very few classes or very few lead cover characteristics that they're trying to interpret, maybe for a certain region, for a certain country, and stuff like that. And how the wealth of uncertainty information we have can be uh, derived, so it really helps that one user to do it. I think that's still where some more work is needed. But in, in, in theory, it's it's possible, and the uncertainty characterization is an is an essential part of these operational systems. Okay, the next question is coming from Olina Dubovic. Okay, uh, Olena Dubovic from Remote Sensing Group at University of Bonn. Thank you also from my side for the great talk. Martin, I have um, a question based on your rich experience in Earth observation and sustainability and land use science. I would like to ask you about um, challenges and perspectives. Uh, so first half of my question, what do you think, what is the biggest challenge which we are facing now in Earth observation for sustainability? Um, research and land use science, and uh, also at the same time, what is the um, role of remote sensing and what is the perspective of remote sensing or Earth observation in the future sustainability agenda? We, where we are heading? Maybe you can, you, you have already been talking about it, uh, but maybe you can just summarize. Yeah. So, one of the biggest challenges, I mean, the, the, it's not so easy to come up with one, obviously. Um, but one of the biggest challenges is really in the land use context. Still, how can we make use of the wealth of wealth, the, the variety, and the, the speed of information we already are getting, and we will be increasingly getting the years for really land use applications? I think there's still a gap there, and I think for that it's still um, some work needs to be done. I'm not talking about. Yeah, detecting certain land, land use types and stuff like that. I think that's already ongoing. We do that, but more really to, yeah, I think uh, uh, Herr Braun made this point. Uh, really, how does it link to really economic issues, for example? Huh? So these kind of land use as an economic process and, and stuff like that. How do, how do these linkages can be done? I think there's a lot of information that is available from uh, those observation that can help in that direction. Um, and how to link that, I think, is still is still a bit of an is still there's I think there are some there's still some innovative ideas needed to to make that happen. Um, and the same is basically for say sustainable attainability. I mean, take these sustainable development goals. We have two hundred and thirty something sustainable development goals. All of them have indicators, a lot of them have sub indicators. So we have hundreds of ways to observe and look at sustainability, right? And uh, I mean, some of them. Cannot those observations will not help. Um, there are you know there are just no information of those that will that will helpful. But for the ones that they are helpful, I think those would be the ones that we can actually really keep well track of. And that is um, and that is because at the end of a 
reporting on sustainable development goals is that you see a trend. You want to see a trend. Huh? You want to see whether sustainability has improved over time. You want to see also um, on where certain activities have seen, have developed in a positive sense or in a negative sense. And basically providing, providing that information on trends and the, and the spatial patterns that come, come with it is, is, is very power, uh, powerful to, to demonstrate that. And um, so that's for the reporting. And again, coming back to the question of, uh, I think, Renzo, it was, um, it's the same for Red Plus or a lot of these climate change mitigation pol policies. Uh, but it's the same for sustainable development. And for example, thinking about what countries, everyone, I guess, can do to achieve these sustainable development goals is, of course, we need to stimulate action. We need, need to, we need to stimulate more of sustainable practices to happen. And how can we use that information to do that? I think that is, that is also, I think, another key gap I think that we have ahead of us. Okay, thank you. I, are there some more questions? I currently, I don't see any blue hand or any questions in the chat. Maybe here are some additional ones. Please speak up if you like to put a question. Okay, this is not the case. So then I can turn it over to Jan Werner again. Yeah, thanks, Heiner, for moderating this really informative question and answer session. I, I really don't want to make too many words, but I had a few thoughts while you were discussing, especially on this issue of uh, bringing together causal analysis with remote sensing, which is, of course, uh, part of the business I'm in. So we are, we are always taking remote sensing outputs as given and use it as outcome variables for our causal analyses of environmental policies or land use change processes and things like that. But we do that rather uncritically because we don't really understand how that data was generated. And uh, with um, Uwe's question, I realized once again, I, I had seen that before, that we shouldn't do that so uncritically. Uh, we should actually work more together. And in, in, in science studies, there is this uh, concept of um, converging disciplines. And uh, I very much see and hope that um, there, there be more conversion between um, social sciences and uh, maybe uh, some other subfields in social sciences and remote sensing. More and more economists actually are starting to work even more uncritically than we do with uh, remote sensing data uh, and other spatial data. If you think of um, all the digitalization processes in rural ran land registries worldwide, um, potentially providing access to the actual location of farms and extensions of farms. Of course, there are data protection issues related to that. Um, that's a wealth of, of information that could be used to actually bring people and, and remote sensing data together. And um, it'd be exciting to, to actually collaborate more with you guys um, on, on how to do that and how to interpret the, the results, given all the complexities involved in generating these data. So yeah, um, Martin, thanks again for the time. I hope we stay in touch on these and other issues. And uh, yeah, if there are other questions or things related to this talk, just send them to me and uh, we'll forward more questions to Martin. I think I'm sure he's happy to respond.